I want to begin this morning with a personal testimony, a personal story, because really what I want to talk about today has led out of that. Uh, and Jordan, can you turn me down a tiny bit? I'm a bit echoey. Uh, it began late August. Uh, me, Cameron, Jordan, Jacob, and Mark uh, Guyon, uh, we went down to a Bible Week festival in Sussex called Revive. And I've been there for many years with Harry, and it was the first time for the rest of the boys that we took with us. We went camping there for a week. You know, a week of worship, a week of Bible study. And little did I know how much, you know, having been there for years, how much God would impact not only me, but the rest of the young men that we went with me. And it was such an amazing, powerful time. All of the guys, and they can tell their own personal testimonies about it at some point. Please ask them about it, because they've got amazing stories. Uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, encountered the power of the Spirit in new ways just completely transformed. Uh, I don't know if you've no I'm going to sort of embarrass Cameron for a second. I don't know if you've noticed the difference in Cameron and in his prayer life. He is like shot up, <laughs> like on the way he prays, just the depth of his faith. And it's all due to God and the power of his spirit. Now, one of the main things that and takeaways that came out from that week for at least us as the boys was that there was a few sermons, like quite a few in a row, and they all had a common theme. And it was all about, uh, well, they all had a common theme about fasting, which is very interesting. And I've fasted before, and we sometimes hear about fasting. We mainly hear about prayer when we read the Bible, and we sometimes read some passages about fasting. We go, all right, cool. That's like giving up food, right, or something. We don't quite understand what fasting's about. But I remember hearing a sermon about uh, the book of Esther and how when she went in before King Xerxes, and I will look at this passage later in more detail, but she went before King Xerxes. She didn't rely on her own uh, humanly wit or charm or strength or whatever ability she had. She went and called all the Jewish people at the time to pray and fast. And there was a reliance on God. And there was just a, a call there uh, in that sermon to pray and fast. And I remember being so spoken to by the Lord hearing that. And unbeknownst to me, uh, the Lord was giving that same message to all the other young guys with me, as in Mark, Cameron, Jordan. We all were feeling the Lord tell us the same thing. And that was to pray and fast. To pray and fast for all of you as a church, all of us as the church here in Inverkeeving and for the nation, and particularly as well for Jacob Guyon. Uh, we wanted to pray and fast for him. We felt that actually we haven't been praying enough for him. We maybe don't, haven't had enough faith in God or whatever it is, but we felt a call from God, an encouragement, not a condemnation, but encouragement, come and pray and fast. And so we did. We got back and... Uh, this is now, we, we just decided we'll, we'll pray and fast for a day every two weeks. We, and uh, we prayed and fast yesterday uh, for it. We do, we're doing it every two weeks on a Saturday. And this is, I believe, the, the fifth time we've done it, or the fifth time we've fasted and prayed for Jacob. And I'm just so happy and pleased to see Jacob here this morning and looking well. Yes, there's still some infections to deal with, some antibiotics, still some progress. But folks, he's made such a big leap. And I think that's due to God. Uh, and prayer and fasting, and all your prayers as well. I'm not saying that no one else has prayed. We were all praying, and God's hearing and listening to us. So actually, can we just thank God and give a clap to God for answers to prayer for Jacob? Because thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jacob. We're praying for you. We're not going to stop praying for you until we see a breakthrough, okay? Like, we're not going to stop. Me and the boys are not going to stop, at least. <laughs> Me and the boys are not going to stop. And for Raymond, too, for healing. Uh, but there was just this call to pray and fast. And then another story that kind of leads into that. A few of us as church leaders have been doing this thing called Lead Academy. Uh, me, Leslie, Helen, and Derek have been doing it. And we had our last session, which was looking at discipleship and how we do discipleship in the church. And hopefully you've read the minutes from the church meeting. If you weren't at the church meeting, Helen gave a summary of it there. But there was, we, we, there was an exercise that we had to do at this Lead Academy, and it was called a kedging exercise, which is this sailing term where you throw an anchor forward because that's where you want to go, and it kind of pulls you to where you want to go. So it was this idea of let's look into the future. 
imagine church in five years time if there was no hindrances whatsoever like just full imagination what would the ideal church be what would you want church to be in five years time and hopefully obviously it's biblical stuff and uh, luckily we all did come up with biblical stuff we wrote down our ideas uh, and then there was once you had that vision of church it was then okay how do you get there now now talk about the practical steps and one thing I just, you know, out of my own prayer and fasting that I'd been doing and inspired from the Lord, I said to the, uh, the leaders, Helen and Leslie and Derek, I was like, we need to pray and fast. We can't go forward as a church. We can't be what God wants us to be. We can't reach that vision until we pray and fast because God builds the church. God might use us and through us. Yes, Paul says, I'm a skilled master builder. I'll build the church, but he does it through Jesus. And Jesus said, I will build my church. It's right there at the back. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So Jesus builds the church. And so if we want to see what church is meant to be, we need to pray. We need to fast. Sounds basic, I know. We all know this. But actually, we need to hear it again and again and again. We actually need to pray. But particularly with that, we need to fast as well. And so with that, all the church leaders somehow convinced them, uh, we're going to pray and fast. Uh, together regularly. We haven't decided how regularly yet, but we'll figure out the details. But with that as well, we felt that we wanted to invite the whole church to pray and fast as well, because we're all the body of Christ, not just the leaders. We're going to lead by example, yes, we're going to do it regardless of any of the rest of you join us. And again, it's optional, but we wanted to invite the whole church to pray and fast. And so this is a long-winded introduction to say, I'm going to teach about fasting this morning because we felt that was necessary to get to that point. If you want to, okay, we're calling you to fast. Well, what is that? What does that actually mean? Because maybe you've heard about fasting and you think about, okay, maybe it's fasting from the body or you know, not eating food. Maybe it's social media or whatever. Okay, what does the Bible actually say about fasting? That's what I'm going to look at this morning. So first of all, what is fasting? Well, Interestingly enough, as I was looking throughout the Old Testament and New Testament about passages when fasting pops up, I found this really interesting thing that every time fasting pops up, it's always associated with mourning. And I found that so interesting. There was a, there was a mourning. The other association with it was humbling. It was mourning and humbling. And then every time there was fasting, there was also the withholding of food of some sort whether it be some sorts of food or food completely, and sometimes food and drink. But the most when it was food and drink was three days because you can't survive three days without water, <laughs> which makes sense. So fasting always includes food. Now that makes me think from the top of the, some, there's a modern invention in church right now that you can fast social media. I think it comes from, from Lent and let's give up something. Oh, I'll give up chocolate, I'll give up this, I'll give up that. I'll give up social media. While that might be a great spiritual discipline, for all you youngins out there, I know some of the more mature of us don't really use social media. But if you do as well, you don't really need to fast for it. But what I will say is that that is not real fasting. Every time fasting pops up in the Bible, it always includes food. And what about the mourning, though? Why do the people mourn? Well, they seem to be mourning for the things that I think God mourns for. There seems to be a humbling ourselves before God. And that fasting is always is, is a spiritual practice about seeking God for something deeper. But what does that actually do? What does it achieve? What's the point in it? And that's where I want to go through five lessons this morning that throughout the Bible that we can learn about fasting and why we do it. What does it even achieve? What's the point in it? So we'll start with Jesus because that's the best place to start. Lesson one, Jesus teaches us about the point of fasting. Jesus himself fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, a very long fast and not a typical fast that everyone is called to. And so when you talk about fasting, I'm talking about the church calling the fasting. I'm not saying you've got to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. So don't worry. You can still eat every now and then. Uh, <laughs> but when Jesus himself fasted and the devil tempted him to break his fast and to eat some bread... He replied with scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 6. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And actually, I think that is the underlying spiritual principle about fasting. Why do we fast? It's a reminder that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. We live in a deeper spiritual reality that comes from God and 
are crying out to him for his life and living by his word. And so interestingly enough then, fasting, if you look at it from that perspective, in itself becomes a form of prayer. But the act of withholding food from your body is saying, Lord, I need more than bread. I need more than whatever basic food I need or nutrition. I need you. And so you're praying with your body. It's a physical act of prayer. That's what fasting is. It's a physical act of prayer saying, Lord, I need your word. I need your spirit. I need your life in me, not just food every day. So it's a physical act of prayer, and it's a crying out to God. Secondly, what Jesus taught about fasting is that he actually expected his followers to fast. It wasn't an optional extra that you do for the super spiritual elite. It's actually for every Christian. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, in his Sermon on the Mount, one of the most famous teachings that Jesus gave, in the very center of a sermon, he teaches the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, etc. Straight after the Lord's Prayer, he says, when you fast. Not if you fast, but when you fast. Now in the context, he's talking about uh, not being a hypocrite when you're fasting. Don't just do it for public praise, but do it for a real relationship with God. It says this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 to 18. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces and their fa that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So what Jesus is teaching here is that, first of all, there's an expectation to fast because he uses when, not if. When you fast. Now, that doesn't mean you fast all the time. It doesn't mean you fast in every season of life. But there is an expectation that at some point in the Christian life, there is an appropriate time to fast. And we'll look at those examples later about when it is appropriate to fast. But there is an expectation there. When you fast. But when you do fast, don't do it for the public praise of others. Don't do it just to be known. Yes, I know I've announced this morning that we've been fasting and praying, but I'm not doing that for public praise. I'm doing it to hopefully share a story and share in a, how the Lord's called us to pray and fast and encourage you with that. But it's not about, oh, wow, these people are fasting. Wow, Michael's fasting. Oh, this person's fasting. No, actually, you're meant to look after yourself. What the Pharisees would do at the time was that they would make themselves look all gloomy, cover themselves with ash, and make it known that they were fasting and make it so obvious. Oh, wow, look at this spiritual man. He's fasting in the street. Wow, he's so spiritual. It's not about that, Jesus says. Jesus says fasting's from the heart. It's about your relationship with God. It's about you between you and God. It's that seeking out of God. Remember, man should not live by bread alone. It's that same principle. You're seeking God. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. I don't understand fasting. Let me say that right now. I don't understand particularly why the withholding of foods. I get the principle behind it. I know I've just said that. That it's about living by God's word and not just food. But I also don't understand it. But God says he'll reward it. That's a promise. Okay? So you don't need to understand it to do it. But it is an expectation. And Jesus says that actually if you fast your Father in heaven who sees you in secret, when you do it with the right heart, will reward you. So that's the next thing on fasting. Jesus also says, in terms of that expectation to fast, uh, the Pharisees go, or the disciples of John in Matthew chapter 9, go and question him and say that then the disciples of John came to him. This is Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 and 15. Disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Notice the mourning as a synonymous with fasting, by the way. Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So the disciples, again, will fast. There's an expectation for it. So we are expected to fast. The spiritual principle of fasting is a crying out to God. It's a physical form of prayer. That's what fasting is all about. <clears throat> the next lesson is from Isaiah 58. Wait till my Bible loads, unfortunately. There we go. 
And Isaiah 58, I'm going to read the whole chapter because this whole chapter is all about fasting. So I'm not going to say please forgive me because it's always good to hear scripture. But just listen to this and what Isaiah says about fasting. Cry aloud. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression and to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not, Lord? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed, to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I chose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and to not hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry, and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday, and the Lord will guide you continually, and satisfy your desire in the scorched places, and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail." And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundation of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn, if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, and seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord." And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you the heritage of the Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And then this continues in chapter 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that you so that he does not hear. What Isaiah is talking about in this time was that the people of Israel, they were outwardly, religiously practicing fasting as if that made God hear them. And yet Isaiah, God sends Isaiah to speak through them and say, your fasting just by doing it is not going to make God hear you. It's not about the actual religious practice of it. Just by fasting, you're not going to somehow magically have God hear you. At least not in the way that they were doing it, because what Isaiah's critique of them is, is that they were seeking God, and yet they were practicing wickedness. They were being hypocrites, in other words. They were not actually doing righteousness at all. In other words, there's no point in fasting if you do not have the right heart in the first place. If your heart is not to do what is right in God's eyes and what is right to your neighbor, which is what Isaiah is getting at. He's saying that this is the preferable fast that I want, that you actually care for your neighbor, that you actually do justice and righteousness for everybody around you. And then God will hear you, not because you're fasting, but because you're in a right relationship with God. What's that scripture? The Lord is near to the righteous, his ears towards them to hear their prayer. We are righteous by faith in Christ, brothers and sisters. And through that faith in Christ, he then inspires us by the power of the Holy Spirit to do what is right to our neighbor. So we as Christians hopefully should not be like this, 
but it's just still a warning, which is why I need to talk about it, that actually fasting in and of itself, just doing it religiously, will not make God automatically hear you. Let's make that clear. It's not about the act of doing it. It's about the heart behind it. But Isaiah doesn't say that you shouldn't fast at all. What he's saying is that practice righteousness and then fast if you do, because that's the real fast God wants. But I think also what Isaiah is really teaching here is that if we are to fast, then we're to not seek our own pleasure. Three times, I think, if you read or were listening carefully to that, Isaiah talks about you're doing things for your own pleasure. You're fasting for your own pleasure. I think a lot of the time, maybe we want to fast because I was like, oh Lord, I really want a new Toyota. I'm going to fast and pray. I'm going to really be serious by God. I'm going to seek that. It's, God's not a slot machine. And we know that about prayer. It's the same for fasting. Just because you fast food doesn't mean God will automatically hear you and provide your, all your needs. God will provide all your needs, sorry, but not all your wants and desires. But fasting here and what Isaiah is teaching is about God's kingdom. That's the heart of it. If you're fasting and praying that the, the bonds of wickedness would be loosed and that people would be set free and that they would know God, that's what you should fast about. That's what you should pray about. And he talks about healing in there. Then shall your healing speed up quickly. I think praying and fasting for healing for other people, that's definitely something we should pray for in our fasting. So fasting is about the heart. It's about God's kingdom at the center. If we're fasting for our own desires, we're not going to get anywhere. And the act of fasting will not automatically make God hear you. It's all about what you're fasting for. Are you fasting for God? Are you seeking him and his kingdom and saying, Lord, I need you. I need to live not by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The third lesson on fasting comes from Daniel, chapter 9 and 10. And this is just revealing how fasting is actually used in a spiritual warfare way. In Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 to 3, it says this, In the first year of Darius, the son of Assyrius, the, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, that is Babylon, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the book of the numbers the years, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, what must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer, pleas of mercy, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So notice Daniel is practicing fasting. And then all the way to verse 20 says this, While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord, my God, for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man, Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision at first, that is, an angel, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me, saying, O oh, Daniel, I have now come to you to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas of mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it, uh, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. And Gabriel reveals a vision to Daniel. Now, the important part there is that when Daniel prayed and fasted and sought the Lord, he got an immediate answer there. But I want to contrast, I just want to contrast that, and that's why we read this first, with Daniel chapter 10. Because the very next chapter, it says this. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning. Remember, mourning is synonymous with fasting here, and he does talk about not eating particular things. Although he didn't fast food completely, interestingly enough. I was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for a full three weeks. Then he said to me, fear not, Daniel. Oh, so, sorry, this is now verse 12. Skip forward to the answer. Uh, he now gets a visit from an angel again after three weeks. And the angel says to him, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. Now, this is the confusing part. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, hi, 
One of the chief princes came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to you to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. What's going on here? I think this is a... Oh, and everyone who reads this passage thinks this is a, a, a behind the scenes of what's going on in the spiritual realm. From the moment Daniel started praying, his prayers were heard. I think this is a lesson sometimes for perseverance in prayer and why sometimes even Jesus himself taught us to persevere in prayer and why we don't see answers straight away. We actually get a glimpse of why we don't see an answer straight away. Daniel's prayer was heard straight away. The angel makes that clear. From the moment you started praying, we heard. We were sending a response. The angel was sent to him. But then he was resisted by the prince of the kingdom of Persia. What's that all about? Well, we get, um, thankfully, some understanding from Paul in the New Testament where he says, actually, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness in the heavenly realms. In other words, spiritual beings. So what the prince of Persia here is, and what most Bible scholars understand it to be, is that this is actually a spiritual being, a, a demonic one, an evil one, who is stopping the angel Gabriel from getting to Daniel answering his prayer. It's what we, the concept of what we call spiritual warfare, that actually there was an immediate hearing of the prayer, but a delay to the answer because there was a battle in the spiritual realm going on over it. Now, why is there a battle? Don't, you don't quite need to understand that, but there is. And that's the important thing to understand, that prayer and fasting is used in spiritual warfare because Daniel not only prayed, he fasted for a full three weeks. Didn't do a full fast, but he did not eat any delicacies, meat or wine entered his mouth. This is what we usually call, by the way, a Daniel fast. You might have heard that before. Remember, Helen actually challenged me on that uh, about saying, don't talk about Daniel fast. Because, but that's because most people think of a Daniel fast as in Daniel chapter 3, I believe, uh, Daniel withholds eating the meat of the Babylonians and only eats vegetables. But that was nothing to do with fasting. That was so that he could still be Jewish, basically, and not and keep the kosher laws the, of the Jewish people without eating unclean meat. And actually, he was tested and showed to be way healthier than the other Babylonians. But interestingly enough, this is Daniel chapter 10. At this point, the fact that Daniel's saying he ate no meat is saying that he now eats meat, but per, probably clean meat at this point rather than unclean meat, as he's now well into his time as a court official in Babylon. So the Daniel fast is not Daniel chapter 3 of just eating vegetables. That's not a fast. That was just him to try and keep kosher. But what a real Daniel fast is, is what Daniel did here, eating no delicacies and no meat or wine entered his mouth. But that doesn't mean that he couldn't eat bread or vegetables. But some people think it's just vegetables. It's probably bread as well. And even maybe dairy products, milk, that might not necessarily be a delicacy. Maybe it is. It depends what you count as delicacy, but I think usually when delicacy pops up, it usually is like cakes and figs and fig cakes, stuff like that. So this is really about cutting off the luxuries in your diet, and that counts as a fast. But it's, a, it's still a withholding of food. That's the important part. So all fasting is a withholding of some sort of food. And this is what was considered a Daniel fast. But he mourned for three weeks, which was, again, a type of fasting, eating no delicacies, no meat or wine. And during this three weeks of praying and fasting, trying to seek understanding, there was a battle going on in the spiritual realm. And he didn't get an immediate answer to prayer, but he did eventually. And so it's just interesting to point out that Daniel chapter 9 he prays, he gets an immediate answer, it seems. Daniel chapter 10, he prays and he has to pray and fast for three weeks and then he gets an answer. There are sometimes delays and we don't understand why, we don't need to understand why, but you need to trust God in the process. That's the point I'm trying to make. And there's warfare that's going on in the spiritual realms and actually you're fasting, somehow God uses it as part of your praying in that spiritual war. So that's the fourth, uh, third lesson that I want to point out. Finally, the fourth, well, not finally, the fourth lesson is from Esther. This was the very passage that I heard a preach on which inspired me and the boys to call to, uh, call to fast and pray in the first place. This is from Esther chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. And just the context for people who don't know the story of Esther, 
very well. Hopefully you do, but if you don't, basically there's been a plot that the people of uh, Israel are, are living in uh, under the king uh, in Persia, basically or where Babylon was, but the king of Persia kind of took over. And they're, they're living there in exile. And <clears throat> there's been a plot by one of the court officials called Haman to kill all the Jews in all the land. And uh, a Jewish a guy called Mordecai comes to Esther and he's talking through one of Esther's servants back and forth. There's kind of like a back and forth between Esther's servant uh, relaying the message between Mordecai and Esther. And this is quite a bit in the way of the conversation, kind of the, the climax of their conversation that they're having. Mordecai is basically trying to get Esther to go and speak to the king and stop this plot against the Jews happening. Mordecai says this in verse 13. Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go and gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink, excuse me, for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went out away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. First of all, as I said when I began, the amazing thing about this story was that Esther didn't rely on herself. She went and called the people to pray and fast with her. She didn't rely on her own strength, but relied on God. And in a time of crisis, which it was, they got the people to pray and fast. But the amazing thing here that I want to point out is what Mordecai says to her. He drops this, I think, just a theological bomb right here. Theology means the study of God, by the way. It's just this, this such a, an amazing truth. Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place. Mordecai had such faith in God that even if Esther didn't stand up to the plate at the time and speak on behalf to the king and stop this plot, Mordecai had faith in God that he would still protect the Jewish people, that he would raise up deliverance from them in another place. And I think this is just an amazing truth that actually God will bring about his purposes either way, regardless of us. He will bring it about. His kingdom is certain. Jesus is going to return whether we like it or not. <laughs> Hopefully we like it. Hopefully we want that as Christians. But God will bring about his purposes with or without us. But the amazing thing about, this, about Esther here and what Mordecai is saying to her is that you, Esther, can be part of God's kingdom. Perhaps God will raise up deliverance even if you don't do it but perhaps you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. If you keep silent, you're going to perish. Don't think you're going to escape. But God will still bring about deliverance. You'll die, but God will bring about deliverance. However, if you speak up at this time, you can be part of God's plans and kingdom and purposes to save the Jews. Brothers and sisters, the thing that inspired me when I was hearing this preach for the first time when I went to revive was this point exactly, that actually all of us are can be in this Esther moment for such a time as this, where God will still bring about his kingdom purposes without us. That's, that's going to happen. But you can be the ones that God works through. You can be silent. You can not do anything. You have your, you know, hopefully your ticket of salvation in Jesus, maybe. You have that passive thing. I'll sit by. I'm going to wait till Jesus returns. That's great. You're going to be saved because you have faith in Christ. Hallelujah. But for such a time as this, maybe you've come into the kingdom of God, that you would stand up and actually be part of God's purposes to bring about his kingdom. Because after all, Jesus told us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. God wants us to be part of the kingdom of God. God wants us to be active 
uh, vessels of his uh, power and truth here on the earth. He wants to use us to bring about his kingdom. He'll go on to bring it about either way, with or without us. But that's because he wants to, he'll raise up others to do it if we don't. But there will always be people who will respond. The question is, will you be one of those people? If you have faith in Christ, this is nothing to do with salvation. Of course, you're going to be saved at the end of the day. Yes, but why do we settle for just salvation when Jesus wants us to do so much more? When he's given us the privilege not to just have salvation for ourselves and be selfish, but rather spread the gospel to all people and preach the gospel to all nations and be people who pray, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. And God actually answering those prayers because he told us to pray them, pray that. And we know that if we pray according to his will, he will answer us. God wants to use us and our prayers. And actually fasting is about that. Prayer and fasting is about that. And Esther understood that. She heard this cons actually, for maybe you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And she understood this. And she went, actually, I'm going to stand up. Sure, if I stand aside, I'll perish. But I'm going to stand up for God and be the one he uses to bring deliverance for the Jewish people. And then her response to that call, the call of God, was to pray and fast. Because she was taking God seriously. She was saying, God, we need you to enter in. We need you to bring the deliverance. We, I don't want to rely on my wits and charm. I don't want to leave it up to chance. I want to rely totally and wholly on you. And that's what fasting is all about. It's man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. It's saying, Lord, I need you in this situation. Lord, we need your kingdom for your church. We need your kingdom for this nation. It's saying, Lord, we're tired of doing church our own way and doing it our, in our own strength. But saying, Lord, we need your power. There's always more of God. There's always more of God, brothers and sisters. You can, only, you can go as deep with God as you want to go. But it's as much as you want to go. You can stop at any point, but you can always go deeper. Because God is infinite. Why do we stop? Why don't we go all in for Jesus and be saying, and say, Lord, yes, here I am, send me, like Isaiah says. Here I am, send me. Folks, will, we'll be, will, will we be Esther's? Or are we just going to stand back and let the world crumble and let God sort, use other people to do it? Because God's going to do it either way. But let's be part of it. And that's what hit me at Revive. That's what hit me. I was like, God, I don't want to stand back and just be passive in my Christian life. God, I want to go all out for you. I want to be used to bring your kingdom. And so, yeah, I don't understand fasting. I don't really understand prayer. But I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast. Because you say that it works and you respond to it when it's done in the right heart for his kingdom. So I'm going to do that. And I hope that actually all of you who feel called to do it will join in with us as a whole church. As I said, the leadership, hopefully they're not dissuaded, are going to do it regardless. But let's all do it if we are able. And I'll get into different types of fasting later so we have some practical tips. This leads to my last point. Fasting is always, when's the appropriate time for fasting? Uh, in Joel chapter 2, we learn fasting is used for times of crisis. Folks, our nation is in crisis right now. I, I've never seen the younger generation so lost and so broken. They, they don't know their right hand from their left hand. They're like the people of Nineveh. They don't know their right hand from their left. They don't know what is right and wrong. And I don't blame them. And the whole nation is filled with wickedness. And, you know, we deserve the judgment of God. And our church, quite frankly, I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about the church in the Western world and the church and in the nation. We're just, to be honest, we're a bit lackluster. Folks, there's more to God and there's power in the Holy Spirit that we can live by to be his witnesses in all the earth. And so Joel says this, after declaring the day of the Lord is coming, which, is, which was in that time the people of Babylon coming and bringing judgment, God says this, Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and with mourning, and rend your hearts, not your garments. Return to your Lord, 
the Lord your God, this is Joel chapter 2 from verse 12, sorry. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even the nursing infants, and let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations." Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? This passage is all about judgment was coming upon the people of Israel. It was a time of crisis. And God says, fast, pray and fast. Don't just leave it up to chance. Don't just leave it up to a few prayers. Come and pray and fast. Folks, our nation needs the church and the church needs God. If there was ever a time to pray and fast, it's actually now. And you know what? Today is the day of salvation. You might think, well, when is an Esther time? Today is the day of salvation. Now is the favorable time. Now is the time to fast and pray. Yes, there's sometimes seasons where, there, where we don't need to fast, but actually there is a, this is a season to fast and pray. For us to go deeper with God as a church, to be filled with the power of the Spirit, for the gospel to go forth, and for the sick to be healed. And so, I plead with you, to be honest. I, I, I do. On behalf of the Lord, because I believe the Lord's calling His church to pray and to fast. Not just me, not just the young adults, and it's not just youthful zeal. This is God's call to His church. Come and pray and fast. We as a leadership, as a church, we've decided we're going to do this anyway. To see that vision of God's glorious church come to pass in hopefully five years' time. So we'll see how it goes. But it's going to happen if we pray and fast because God's going to do it. So let's, as a church, pray and fast. Now, practicalities, we're not all of the same abilities. And you might think, well, I I don't know how how much I can fast. Fasting's about the heart. Let me say that again. It's not about the ritual of it. It doesn't have to be a full day fast. It doesn't have to be four-day fast, three-day fast. I'm not talking about that kind of fasting. Even fasting one meal a day, which I think anyone could do, and I'm not saying doing it every day either, but just fasting one meal and deliberately spending that time what, that you would do preparing a meal and eating the meal in prayer, that's enough. And so it's up to each of you to decide in your hearts what is an appropriate fast for you to do. You can do a, what we like to call a juice fast, which is uh, what we've been doing as young uh, as, as the boys, is just uh, we've been allowing liquids, thin liquids though, like juice uh, or tea and coffee and stuff, but fasting food all day. Uh, we have breakfast nine in the morning, so we do have breakfast, but then we fast food the rest of the day and we break the fast on the Sunday morning, which we've done this morning. But it doesn't have to be that. Again, it can be one meal. It could be a Daniel fast. You just get rid of delicacies for the day uh, and meat and wine and and just live on the basics of food. Uh, It doesn't really matter as long as you... Fasting does involve food, so it's not just social media fast. You do need to fast some food. That's kind of the point of it because it's man should live by bread alone, not by social media alone, okay? Man should live by bread alone. So do fast something. But it doesn't have to be uh, every day. It can only be, uh, really, we're just asking for one day. And so practically wise, how would we want to do that if you're feeling you want to do this? I have made a sign-up sheet, which is right there beside the offering box. And it's basically got Monday to Sunday. Basically, think of a day that works for you in your time schedule. Think of what you, as you know, what your abilities can allow, your age, your health. Those are all important things. I'm not saying you have to do it every day time as well. I'm basically going to fast and pray every second week, which is what we are doing anyway. So hopefully, if people sign up every day, we'd actually eventually collectively have a whole week of prayer and fasting every second week. That's the idea. Think of what you can do and what day you can do it suits best and basically go for it every second week. We're going to start, if you want to do that, 
in two weeks' time, starting the week, the 28th of October, uh, which is the next time that we use the boys' fast, and I just thought that makes sense, uh, to go do it that way. And there was one other point there. I completely forgot about it. Oh, well. <coughs> Folks, I encourage you, if you feel that you could do that, even if it's just a meal, please do that. We're starting every second week. Pray. Oh, that's what I'm going to say. What are we praying and fasting about? That's very important. I feel it is important that we do pray and fast collectively uh, about something. So what do I feel the Lord wants us to pray and fast about? Very simple. The church, as in us as a congregation, and then the church and the nation, that we'd be filled with God's power and grow deeper of God. Whatever you can think of in church needs, fast and pray about that. So the church. Then all who are sick, including Jacob Guyon, Raymond, everyone in the congregation, pray for those who are sick, pray and fast for them. So include them in your fasting and prayer. Then family members who do not know Jesus, fast and pray for them so that we can, uh, the Lord can reveal themselves to them and we can share the good news of Jesus, that God loves them with them. And then anyone you want to share the gospel with as well, pray and fast for them. Let's use this for evangelism. Let's change the nation that way. Very simple. Those four things, the church, the sick, your families, and anyone you want to share the gospel with. Fast and pray for those things. And we're going to start every second week from the 28th of October, from that week beginning. I encourage you to sign up. Just whatever you can do, it doesn't have to be much, even if it's just one meal and you spend that time in prayer for those things. I think, well, I would be very happy and joyous to see that, but it's not about me and it's not about, yes, I'm pleading with you for it, but it, I believe the Lord will reward you and will reward us as a church and help us grow as a church. And it's important that we do this as a church collectively. Let me end in prayer. Father God, thank you that you're so good and gracious. Lord, I may not understand fasting, but Lord, I thank you that you reward it. I thank you that you're faithful to your word when we do it in the right heart and seek your kingdom. And Lord, I just pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, for anyone whom you would like to join in the fast here this morning, Lord, would you put on their hearts? Lord, I pray there'd be no condemnation. Let me say that as well. Like, if you don't want to fast, that's okay as well. Sorry, let me say that as well. You don't have to fast. This is optional. But Father, for anyone whom you'd be calling to fast, Lord, place it on their hearts by your spirit. In the name of Jesus, Lord, build your kingdom here. Amen.